Uh, hello, welcome uh, to a special ACM uh, learning webinar. The webcast reflects ACM's deep commitment to lifelong learning. Our aim is to empower computing professionals and students who join ACM's worldwide community of well over 100,000 members. I'm Stu Feldman. Uh, I'm a Vice President of Engineering at Google. I oversee the engineering offices in uh, on four continents. Uh, before that, I was at Bell Labs, Bellcor, IBM Research. I'm also former president of the ACM. I'm the moderator for today's webcast. Uh, so uh, let me say, first of all, that ACM offers innovative educational and professional development resources. These bolter the skill sets, enhance the career development opportunities for our members. We're able to stay competitive in the dynamic computing world with a wide range of, range of the ACM Learning Center resources. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. Oh, we recognize the role of computing in driving innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. Together with uh, timely computing information published by ACM, access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of the computing literature, and international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics. We enable uh, our members to solve critical problems using new technology, enriches our lives, and advances society in this digital age. Let me go over a few housekeeping items for this webinar, please. At the end of the presentation, we'll have time for questions. We hope you'll have several. In the top right corner of the slide area on your screen, there's a button that allows you to enlarge the slides. You can also enlarge them at any time by dragging the corner of the slide window. Slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You can minimize the slide area, Q&A, and bio screens using the buttons on the bottom panel. You can also use a number of widgets also found on the bottom panel, including Facebook, Twitter, other sharing tools, and a resources list. If you're having problems with the program, please press the F5 key on your keyboard if you're using Windows, or Command plus R if you're on a Mac to refresh your console or close and relaunch the presentation. You can also visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the slide window. To control volume, adjust the master volume on your computer. At the end of the event, please take a minute to fill out a brief survey using the red colored survey widget in the bottom panel. The sessions being recorded will be archived. It will be available for review in the next few days at learning.acm.org. If you think of a question during the presentation, please type it into the Q&A box, click on the submit button. You don't need to wait until the end of the presentation to begin submitting questions. You may also use the Q&A box to suggest topics for future webinars of interest to you. So uh, we're also going to try something new uh, with this webcast. You can now use Facebook and Twitter widgets on the bottom panel to share the presentation link with your friends, as well as tweet comments and questions using the hashtag SharpACMWebinarSurf. A-C-M-W-E-B-I-N-A-R-C-E-R-F. We'll be watching your tweets. Today's presentation is Internet's Future Social Implications, Upheaval, or Trex Promise by Vint Cerf. Vint uh, genuinely is one of the fathers of the Internet. He is one of the co-authors of the TCP uh, IP protocol, without which you wouldn't be watching any of this. Uh, he is uh, Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at uh, Google. Uh, he is the uh, President of ACM. Uh, the, his list of accomplishments is far too long to uh, read. You can easily find it on the web. You might use Google. He was the first chair of ICANN, and he is one of the first winners of the new Queen Elizabeth model, uh, Medal for Engineering in the 2013 to be awarded soon. Uh, at this point, uh, I would like to uh, hand this over to Vint to present. I'll come back on later to uh, ask some of the questions that you submit. Thank you. Uh, Vint, uh, uh, it's all yours. 
Thank you so much, Stu. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, try this uh, method of communicating with our members. Uh, and thank you, by the way, for all the promotional material about ACM. That's a the trouble of repeating it. Um, but I do want to emphasize that there's a great deal going on at ACM, and those of you who are listening uh, should take time to go visit the ACM website and just get a sense for the incredible scope of activity that is going on and the opportunities that you have uh, to benefit from your membership in the organization. Uh, I'd like to uh, get to uh, my first slide, except that the system doesn't seem – there we are. Uh, so if you can all see this first slide, I hope, um, you'll see the statistics of the Internet as they stood in September uh, of, or June of 2012. So these numbers are, are clearly lower than the current ones. I just don't have more recent data to show you at this point. Uh, but as you can see, there were nearly 1 billion machines on the Internet that had uh, essentially uh, fixed domain names and, um, and uh, IP addresses. So they represent the kind of server community on the system. Of course, many of you know that those servers are not simply individual machines. They're often instantiated in the middle of large-scale cloud-based systems, such as the ones you see at, uh, at Google or Amazon or uh, Microsoft and others. <clears throat> that, uh, to that number, to that billion, uh, must also be added the machines that are episodically connected, like laptops and desktops, tablets, and increasingly mobiles that are not necessarily online all the time. And so the actual total number of devices that are Internet capable is unknown, but might very well uh, exceed 2 or 3 billion at this point. Uh, which brings me to the other uh, statistic, which is the number of users of the Internet. And here again, we don't have absolutely uh, precise statistics because um, you don't have to go register in any one place to be uh, a user of the Internet. So these are estimates made by Internet World Stats. Um, and in mid-year, last year the number stood at 2.4 billion. I dare say that uh, as we approach the summer uh, here um, in 2013 that the number has probably reached 3 billion, but I'm uh, only guessing. Uh, the other statistic, which I think is equally important, is the number of mobiles that are in use, and, and that uh, figure is on the order of 6.5 billion. I think many of you will know that not uh, – uh, let's see, many people have more than one mobile, which leads to the very funny statistic that uh, mobile capability has penetrated in some countries 150 to 200 percent, uh, simply meaning that uh, some people have more than one. Uh, the number of machines that are Internet enabled in that uh, cohort is probably on the order of 20 percent now, but I'm sure that statistic will increase over time so that eventually – most mobiles that you acquire will have uh, full uh, Internet access, although in many cases the data rates available will vary depending on uh, the locale. If we go to the next slide, uh, what uh, – that's assuming I can find the right button here. Here we go. Um, we can see where the people are, at least uh, as estimated by uh, the Internet World Stats Organization. I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of things. First of all, uh, these numbers look quite dramatically different 10 years ago. Uh, North America was at the top of the list in terms of absolute numbers of users and in terms of uh, average uh, penetration of the population. Now, now you find North America number three on the list, and although it is the most intensely uh, penetrated in terms of number of users, the uh, percentage of users online, we are clearly uh, overwhelmed by uh, the billion users in Asia, and you'll note that the percentage penetration of the population in Asia, which is on the order of 3 billion people, uh, is only 27.5% uh, as of uh, last June. Uh, so half of those billion users happen to be in uh, mainland China. Uh, so the point I want to make here is that despite what we hear about and perhaps even know about uh, the Chinese use of the Internet and interference with it, they have made an enormous investment in uh, Internet infrastructure. Uh, so uh, to that we add another half billion users in other parts of Asia. Uh, as you can see, Europe is the next largest uh, population uh, penetrated at very high percentages, 63%. Um, what's funny about Europe, of course, is that the definition of Europe keeps changing because they keep adding countries. So predictions about Europe are difficult because you don't know uh, how many countries will be part of Europe in 10 years' time. I would guess uh, that by 2020, we will probably see about 80% penetration worldwide. Uh, 
I don't believe it will go terribly much beyond that. Again, I could be wrong, but uh, in the U.S., for example, we have uh, reached a kind of asymptote at uh, at 80%. So there's some 20% of the population that just doesn't want to be online, I guess. Uh, I don't fully understand that, but um, that, I think, is probably an interesting uh, prediction. And again, we will see what happens, especially as a large number of people in the world get access to the Internet using their mobiles, and in many cases, that may be the only thing that they use as opposed to tablets and personal computers. So let's uh, press on now to see what else is going on in this uh, network environment. There are a lot of things happening to this now 40-year-old design. Bob Kahn and I did the work initially in 1973. The network was turned on formally in 1983 in January using uh, an IP version 4, uh, the fourth iteration of the design, uh, addressing structure, which allowed 32 bits of address space, which is 4.3 billion terminations. We ran out uh, in uh, February of 2011, at least at the ICANN, uh, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority level. Uh, the address space available from the regional Internet registries was uh, exhausted in uh, Asia PAC uh, and in Europe uh, during uh, 2011 and 2012. Uh, there are still remaining uh, IPv4 addresses available in uh, Africa and Latin America and in North America, uh, but the North American um, complement will probably be exhausted sometime in 2013. So this motivates in part uh, the need for a new address structure, and the packet format for that is called IPv6. It was formally launched in June 6 of 2012, but the standard was uh, essentially developed and agreed uh, around 1996, uh, possibly um, 1998 for final documentation. It has 128 bits of address space, and that's 3.4 times 10 to the 38 addresses. We are currently running we in the community uh, uh, that offers Internet-based services, uh, including ISPs and application service providers, equipment makers, and software makers are offering both v6 and v4 formats simultaneously. The penetration of v6 is still very low, but uh, as uh, we will see later in this discussion, um, it's going to be um, uh, quite attractive to have a v6 address, especially when you have very, very large uh, numbers of devices uh, like set-top boxes or mobiles or automobiles or electrical appliances, all of which need to be addressable. Uh, in the future. So V6 is, uh, is here to stay, and I hope that we see a significant growth in service uh, using that protocol. Uh, the other uh, thing, another thing which is uh, also quite a dramatic change from the earlier days of Internet is that the domain name system itself has been extended to allow non-Latin characters to be used as domain names or in domain name labels. Uh, we're using the Unicode set, uh, code set, which is what is used in the World Wide Web, uh, in order to provide um, uh, text in multiple languages. Those, that same encoding uh, structure is used in the domain name system now, so you can have domain names written in Cyrillic or in Arabic or in Hebrew or Japanese or Korean or Chinese and so on, uh, and that's a big change. Uh, another major change uh, that the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers has introduced is a very large uh, number of potentially a uh, large number of new generic top-level domains. And those are things that had been uh, around uh, since the earliest days of uh, the domain name system, but it consisted of only uh, seven top-level domains. The ones you're familiar with, of course, are .com, .net, .org, .mil, .gov, and .edu, and so on. To, to those were a few more added, uh, about 14 uh, by ICANN in the inter intervening period after its creation in 1998. But now in 2013, uh, ICANN is, has opened up opportunities to propose um, new top-level domains, and some 2,000 applications came in. Uh, not all of them uh, will be adopted necessarily, and in many cases uh, there were collisions. That is to say, more than one party proposed a particular top-level domain, and so that has to be resolved since, in, in theory, only one person or one party can have uh, control over a particular top-level uh, domain name. So that process is underway uh, at, uh, at ICANN. 
Uh, in addition to that, many of you, I'm sure, are very well aware of the various security uh, threats to Internet's operation, and in order to remediate those, a number of things are uh, in development or in deployment. One of the things being deployed now is called DNSSEC for Domain Name System Security Extensions. Uh, and that system uh, is intended to provide uh, software with the opportunity to request a digitally signed answer to a domain name lookup. Uh, the purpose for that digital signature is to verify that the binding of the domain name and the Internet address had not been altered uh, in the uh, interim period after it having, having been installed in the domain name server. Uh, that's intended to uh, reduce the uh, incidence of uh, various kinds of um, uh, phishing and farming attacks uh, that use uh, hijacking of the domain name system by uh, polluting the cache of a resolver, a caching resolver, or, or possibly uh, uh, interfering with the function of the normal domain name and IP address lookup. In addition to that, there are issues with hijacking of the address space itself by uh, essentially, essentially simply by announcing that it's your address space and please send stuff destined to that IP address to, uh, to your network. In order to uh, inhibit that kind of abuse, uh, it is being discussed but not yet implemented to have the regional Internet registries uh, create digital signatures associating an autonomous system with the address space that it has been assigned. And when routing updates uh, are made to the uh, global routing system using the BGP protocol, it will be possible for the recipient of an update to verify that the party announcing uh, the address and the, the uh, direction uh, to which to route traffic to reach that address um, can be validated, again, using digital signatures that associate the uh, uh, autonomous system and the IP address that's being announced. Uh, and that's also intended, again, to uh, remove some threat of hijacking of uh, address space. The last three bullets on the slide are just reminders that sensor networks are becoming a part of the Internet environment, and that will certainly uh, expand dramatically the use of and demand for IP address space. The smart grid, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, is another example of all electrical uh, appliances becoming Internet-enabled and providing um, a possibility for monitoring the use of, uh, of electricity through those uh, appliances and also getting the appliances to uh, avoid using energy during a peak load uh, period by being responsive to uh, an announcement that uh, peak load is being reached. Uh, the last bullet, of course, simply reemphasizes the extraordinary number of mobile devices that are flowing into the environment. I want to emphasize one other thing about um, the uh, these domain names and that I'm sorry, I'm messing up the slides here, and I apologize for that. It's called Twitchy Finger. Um, the uh, mobile devices uh, have an interesting property that um, they are uh, dramatically reinforced by their ability not only to run software on the platform itself, but also to activate and take uh, advantage of computing power and information that's in the Internet. And so the two systems are remarkably enhanced. You have mobile access to content information and actions that you can take that are uh, actually executed by large-scale uh, systems in the Internet, but you also have the ability to, uh, to do this at any time uh, when they're at your convenience, no matter where you are, presuming, of course, that, uh, that you have connectivity from the mobile. So these are uh, all um, examples of significant changes to the Internet's environment. And what I think is exciting about this is that a system that was designed 40 years ago is uh, capable of continued evolution uh, and continues to be uh, open to the invention of new applications and new methods for implementation. And I think that's one of the strengths of the Internet, which we continue to enjoy. Uh, if we go to the next slide now, what you see is just a few uh, illustrations of devices that are part of the uh, Internet environment. Uh, things like picture frames that can download images from websites and then cycle through them. Uh, telephones that look like telephones, but they're really voice over IP devices. Uh, there's an Internet-enabled LED light bulb that sells for about $20. It has an IPv6 radio in it. Uh, it's possible by that means to uh, turn the light off and on or sense what its current condition is. Is it on, off, or broken? 
Um, so all of these kinds of things are uh, are simply becoming part of the normal environment. The uh, image in the middle is a guy with an internet-enabled surfboard, something that was uh, developed, I think, so that he could surf the net while he was waiting for the next big wave. Uh, so there's a laptop in the surfboard with a Wi-Fi uh, transceiver and a Wi-Fi service in the rescue shack back on the beach. Uh, and this is now being sold as a product. And finally, on the left, upper left, you'll see uh, in what is intended to be an internet-enabled refrigerator, uh, which has the uh, interesting uh, feature that it has a nice uh, touch-sensitive, uh, high-resolution display on the door. Uh, and it now becomes a kind of substitute for or an augmentation of the classical uh, household communication system, which has historically consisted of paper and magnets, uh, in at least in American households. And now we can put up websites and blogs and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, page, you know, email and, uh, and many other kinds of uh, instant messaging and video conferencing and all the other things that we enjoy. Uh, can be done right there in the uh, in the kitchen uh, with that uh, device. And I often wondered what else could you do with an internet-enabled refrigerator. And one possibility is to um, make sure that everything that goes in is tagged with an RFID uh, chip, so that the refrigerator actually knows what it has inside. And in that case, uh, it might actually be able to surf the net, finding recipes that could be made using what you have inside the refrigerator. Or it might remind you to go pick up what you need in order to have marinara sauce for the spaghetti dinner that night. Uh, or maybe if you're off, uh, you know, camping somewhere, you might get an email saying, "Don't forget the milk is three three weeks old and it's going to crawl out of the refrigerator on its own." So all of these scenarios are uh, entirely feasible, even if they are uh, not necessarily entirely plausible. Uh, to go on to the next uh, slide here. Um, this is an illustration of a sensor network that I have operating in my house. It's actually a commercial product, so this is not me in the garage with a soldering gun. Uh, the company that made the sensor network is called uh, ArchRock, and it was acquired by Cisco Systems a few a couple of years ago. Uh, basically, each of these devices is about the size of a uh, package of cigarettes. It runs on two AA batteries for very nearly a year. Uh, they are running IP version 6 on, an, on a 6-low-pan uh, uh, substrate. Uh, this system is self-organizing, so you turn things on and they figure out what their connectivity is, and they maintain that radio connectivity even as the uh, uh, trans, uh, transceiving links are varying in their strength uh, depending on local interference. So uh, this is a, a system which I have been able to run for very nearly a year on one set of AA batteries in each of the sensors. In my case, uh, every five minutes, temperature, humidity, and light levels are being captured and recorded through the sensor network to a server down in the basement. And at the end of uh, a year, I have very, very good information, engineering quality information about the uh, functioning of the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. So when it comes time to evaluate or change baffles or change motor speeds, I have real engineering information as opposed to anecdotal information. Uh, one room in the house is the wine cellar, and I, I strive to keep that at 60 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, uh, and uh, humidity up in the 40% range so the corks don't dry out. That system has been instrumented uh, and alarmed so that if the temperature rises beyond 60 degrees Fahrenheit, I guess an SMS on my mobile, and that alerts me to uh, go in and, and reset the cooling system. Uh, and several times when this has happened, I've been far away on travel, and so I asked the ArchRock team if they had remote actuators, and they said yes. And so that's a weekend project to install remote actuators to reset and restart the cooling system. Uh, I did have to ask, though, whether they had a strongly authenticated interconnection or interface for that purpose, because I didn't want a 15-year-old to suddenly mess up my uh, my wine cellar by playing around with the uh, access controls. So that's the sort of thing which is, uh, I think, increasingly common, not necessarily the wine cellars, but the ability to monitor uh, a, a residence or an office uh, to detect security problems, uh, to detect environmental problems, and to report uh, anything arising that might be uh, suspicious or might be in need of attention. So I think you'll see these sensor networks becoming a part of the in, uh, Internet environment from a very, uh, I, I think, very commonly 
uh, all around the world, but especially in those places that are focusing now on uh, the management of environmental uh, resources in order to uh, reduce uh, global warming by being much more thoughtful or reduce the amount of um, electrical power generation required uh, in cases of peak load so that you can actually tell devices to not to use energy while you're at peak load. Uh, one thing that I'll try to illustrate that when we get to the Smart Grid program, which is a major uh, initiative uh, to try to uh, enable electrical electricity consuming appliances to be more responsive. So uh, that, in fact, is the next slide called Smart Grid. And this was a program that began four years ago, initiated by the American Department of Energy and Department of Commerce. The objective was to help standardize or find a way to standardize the controls for these uh, devices that uh, were being internet enabled and were being um, outfitted so that they could be uh, told we're reaching a peak load or you, uh, will you please stop using electricity uh, right now in order to avoid uh, having a, a rolling brownout or a blackout. Uh, the Smart Grid Interoperability Panel was organized to help facilitate the creation of standards so that there would be interoperability among appliances that uh, in, were intended to uh, to be both instrumented and to respond to uh, what's, what's called demand response, where a request is made to not use electricity while a, a peak load had been reached. One obvious benefit of uh, having the ability to control demand is that you don't have to build uh, power generation equipment at high cost that doesn't get used very much, uh, perhaps only 3% of the time. Uh, the Smart Energy Profile 2.0 is a specification for how data flows to and from these devices and uh, how they are controlled. Uh, and it's that standardization which will lead to uh, plenty of opportunity for uh, all kinds of electricity consuming devices to be part of the uh, Smart Grid system. Um, the uh, configuration of this uh, very, very large um, collection of devices is going to be a non-trivial exercise. Uh, we want to make this as simple for homeowners and business operators as possible. So there's still work to be done to get the protocols uh, to be properly um, uh, configured and uh, to get uh, proper access control because you certainly want only people who are authorized uh, to interact with these devices at the home or in the office. Uh, I think that this is going to force us to think very carefully about safety and security because we're starting to edge into the power generation and distribution. This is exacerbated, this particular challenge is exacerbated by the fact that we have an increasing number of devices in even in residential settings that generate electricity. Photovoltaics, for example, or geothermal, uh, or fuel cells, or other you know, wind power all have the possibility of becoming part of the energy producing grid as opposed to simply being consumers of uh, energy. And that, I think, increases and heightens our concern about safety and security. Uh, the other uh, peculiar thing is that we move from a central uh, generation uh, model, which is where we have major utilities that generate electricity, perhaps with nuclear power, or coal burning or oil or something else uh, to a very distributed system in which power is generated all the way in people's residences, for example, in the case of photovoltaics or, uh, or wind power. Controlling and managing a system uh, like this uh, is, uh, is actually a non-trivial exercise, and particularly uh, when you have systems that are not only consuming power but generating it and trying to make sure that you properly configure the system uh, is really quite a, uh, a technical challenge. Uh, the question will be, um, you know, how will users uh, interface to these things and can we make it reasonably simple and still safe? And second, uh, will users want to have multiple parties analyzing uh, their use of electricity and helping them understand what they could do to reduce the uh, uh, usage and therefore reduce their cost? All of that requires standardization, and that's ongoing within the Smart Grid program. I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, draw your attention to the fact that the Internet is now so penetrant in society, even though it's only you know, 30 to 40 percent of the population that's online, 
that uh, governments are becoming extremely interested in uh, what they can do to manage and control the Internet. Now, in some cases, this is uh, an insidious attempt to prevent people from being able to communicate freely, but in other cases, it's a genuine attempt to keep people from harming others using the Internet as the, uh, as the vehicle. Uh, there's an organization which was formed out of a major initiative by the uh, United Nations and specifically uh, initiated by the ITU called the World Summit on the Information Society, uh, which uh, was undertaken, that, that summit was undertaken in the 2003 to 2005 period. And out of that um, international meeting, uh, was formed a group called the Internet Governance Forum, which although it does not govern and it does not take decisions, it is a very important discussion platform where countries all around the world meet with the private sector, with the technical community, with the civil society in order to talk about Internet governance and what that might mean. Uh, and although they don't take decisions, they certainly try to uh, analyze and evaluate and present for consideration uh, issues related to the use of the Internet, and in particular the abuse of it. Uh, the ITU was formed way back as the International Telecom Telegraph uh, Union in around 1865, and it was to standardize uh, the way in which telegraph systems worked. Uh, they then became active as the International Telephony Union and later International Telecommunication Union, uh, dealing with uh, all kinds of technical and policy issues uh, linked to various uh, telecommunication systems. Uh, as the Internet becomes increasingly important for all forms of communication, the ITU has looked uh, to uh, revise its scope in order to include Internet, and there are some people who are resistant to that on several grounds, but perhaps an important one is that as a, an intergovernmental organization, the ITU is not widely known for its um, multi-stakeholder civil society, technical society, and private sector um, capacity because the decisions at the ITU are made by countries. Uh, so there's been quite a bit of debate about the role of ITU in all of this, and many of us who participate in the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Internet Architecture Board uh, and other Internet-related institutions uh, would much rather see um, this kind of uh, activity taking place in a multi-stakeholder environment. Uh, there are also huge issues associated with privacy and safety as well as security. And I think it should be quite plain to everyone that there are lots of security or safety threats, uh, whether that's viruses, worms, or uh, key loggers, or other kinds of abusive software, or it's uh, software for, uh, for tracking people, or uh, software for uh, harassing them, uh, so-called bullying. All of these potential hazards occur in the Internet environment. Uh, so uh, we're, we're clearly uh, going to have to wrestle with these problems. We use language, uh, I think, too uh, readily. Uh, security leads to the term cybersecurity, which leads to the notion of cyber warfare. And I worry that by casting the issue into such a nation state versus nation state uh, uh, model, that we miss the point that safety is what we're all looking for. We would like to feel safe and be safe in the Internet environment. And when we're under attack, sometimes it's not because of a national uh, threat. It may be uh, someone who is deliberately attacking for business purposes or for uh, espionage purposes or just to be uh, simply nasty. Uh, when we're under attack, we would, I think, benefit from having a cyber fire department to help put out the fire. And only after we determine what the nature of the problem was, might we then turn it over to law enforcement authorities in the event that this was a genuine attack and that needs to be remediated in, in legal terms. Uh, I think some people go overboard uh, to, uh, to dealing with this question of um, who did it uh, by insisting that, that no, no one be able to use the network in, uh, anonymously. And I am opposed to forcing people to ath authenticate or identify themselves solely to make use of the Internet. At the same time, I believe there are lots of situations where the other party has every right to say, who are you, and I won't continue our transaction without knowing that. Um, the consequence of this is that I'm a, a, a frank supporter of 
anonymity in the network, but at the same time, I'd like to see uh, technology develop that will allow me to uh, reassure the other party that I really am Vince Cerf and that I am, have uh, these characteristics that uh, allow me to be trusted with a transaction that might be underway. Uh, this gets into the question of what is the legal meaning of a digital signature, for example, even if I've been issued a certificate and I've digitally signed something using uh, cryptographic means, uh, in, if we get into a legal dispute, what uh, what is the weight given to the digital signature versus something that you could exhibit that was uh, signed manually? And we don't have good answers for that, particularly in an in international setting. The other two bullets here, uh, uh, I think, as, uh, as Stu has pointed out, could <laughs> easily be all-day discussions in and of themselves. I think I just want to emphasize two things. First of all, on the intellectual property bullet, it should be apparent to anyone who knows how the World Wide Web works that it's a giant copying machine because a browser goes to a website, downloads a file, and then interprets it. And so anyone who wishes to control copying on the network has got quite a challenge because that's the way the web works. Uh, and yet we have to accept the idea that some information, some content may wish to be controlled by the party supplying it. Other content may be intended for wide dis uh, distribution without compensation and, of course, anything in between, which means that the notion of copyright legally needs to be rethought as, um, as one of many part, uh, places in a spectrum of intellectual property management ranging from public domain which basically says there's no control, all the way up to and including uh, something which is uh, part of a digital rights management uh, mechanism. So um, I think that we have a lot of work to do there to settle on both national and international regimes for protecting intellectual property while at the same time uh, allowing people to share it freely if that's what they wish to do. The last point on this slide uh, is, is a real concern to me. It turns out that uh, every day we use complex software in order to produce complex digital objects, typically files. And those files are literally useless to us unless the software that created them is available in order to both uh, look at them, listen to them, or interact with them. We have a problem of preserving that capability over hundreds of years or even thousands of years because it isn't clear that software written for the purpose of uh, creating content will survive over hundreds of years. And so figuring out how to solve that problem, both technically and legally, if a company goes out of business, if a company decides not to continue to support backward compatibility of new versions of an application, and you've just invested substantial amounts of time to create content using an older version, uh, somehow we have to figure out how to save uh, or solve the problem of making your content uh, accessible and useful uh, over long periods of time. So I use the term digital vellum to mean a regime in which information can be uh, preserved and, uh, and will be preserved for literally hundreds or thousands of years. This is a huge challenge technically. How do I make sure that I can still run old software or interpret old, uh, old files? Uh, and how do I deal with the possibility that companies will go out of business and their intellectual property, including their software, may or may not be available in order to fulfill the objective. So uh, that's another place where lots and lots of research is potentially needed. If we go to the next slide, um, uh, Stu, I know, uh, will say that each one of these bullets is probably worth a semester's worth of <laughs> work. And I just want to emphasize uh, something about the economics of digital information. Uh, it changes the uh, cost of creating and distributing things. You know, when we go from paper or other physical media to digits or bits, uh, we really change the cost of transport and the cost of storage and everything else. And if business models are heavily dependent on what those costs are. For example, in the case of journalism, for many, many years, newsprint was very cheap uh, compared to any other kind of uh, printed publication. And newspapers were able to distribute large amounts of the same information on a regular basis, the daily newspaper, for example. And th they used advertising in that newspaper in order to support the cost of providing the journalism. But um, now we have a problem that um, people are uh, are actually 
able to uh, to like like in Google's case, are able to deliver uh, advertising that's specific to a user, as opposed to showing the same advertisement to all recipients of the news, for example. And this flexibility and uh, and this um, uh, auction-based cost uh, has had a dramatic effect on the business of uh, news reporting. And it's time that we recognize that news is a very, very, or good journalism is a very important part of democratic societies, and we really have to make sure to find a way to support that, uh, even if the older business models no longer work because of the uh, new alternatives in the online world. Uh, manufacturing is also uh, in an interesting situation with the advent of 3D printers. Now, instead of delivering an object, you deliver specifications for its implementation and a device at the other end actually produces the object. Of course, that doesn't eliminate the need for transport because first, the object may need to be transported somewhere other than where it was made, and second, the raw materials for generating the object may be needed uh, at each of the printers, and therefore, uh, we aren't eliminating uh, phys physical distribution and supply chain distribution. Uh, we're just changing the, the uh, kind of, uh, of supply that we might need just something uh, basic to the 3D printer's uh, uh, raw materials. So uh, this is, all four of those bullets are going to be very important to us, I think, in the course of the, the next decade, to say nothing of the rest of this century. I think I'd like to switch uh, into one other topic uh, in the remaining five or so minutes that um, I'd like to speak, and then we'll have the Q&A. Uh, my colleagues at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and I started thinking in 1998 about the kind of networking that would be useful for supporting manned and robotic space exploration 25 years from then, which is uh, putting out into the 2020 period. Uh, and we concluded that point-to-point -point radio links, which had been our friends for space exploration, both manned and robotic, needed to be augmented with serious networking capability. And so we were thinking um, specifically about missions that were planned to Mars, and of which there were many. Uh, and at the time we began this detailed study, uh, the Pathfinder had just landed on Mars in 1997, so we were intensely um, conscious of that, and we were aware of future rover missions that were intended to be launched in 2004. And many of you will know the two rovers landed on Mars, Spirit and Opportunity, in January of that year, 2004, and have roved the uh, uh, the planet for uh, for all the time since then. Uh, one of the uh, devices um, has uh, has stopped uh, functioning, uh, and uh, but the other is still moving around and um, continuing to supply substantial information. Uh, since that time, others have landed as well. And what was interesting is that when the rovers landed uh, on Mars. Um, in 2004, it was thought that we would transmit data directly back from the surface. And it turned out that the radios overheated and had to be reduced in their duty cycle. This led to great complaints because the data rate from the surface of Mars was expected to be only 28 and a half kilobits a second. So it was, uh, it was thought to be a serious deficiency to have to reduce the duty cycle even further. Uh, however, uh, some of the engineers noticed that we still had orbiters that had been used to map the surface of Mars, and they had computing communications capability, and they could be reprogrammed. And so both the rovers and the uh, uh, orbiting satellites were reprogrammed to do store and forward in space. And so now what happens is that all the data comes back from each of the various uh, rovers and is um, uh, accumulated and then transmitted up to the, an orbiting satellite, and that satellite stores the data until it has an opportunity to transmit the data back to Earth. So this little store and forward three-node three network has been the backbone of data delivery from Mars uh, essentially ever since 2004. Uh, if we go to our next slide, uh, you'll see that uh, there are uh, an array of uh, orbiting uh, or, or landed spacecraft that are part of the Earth-Mars uh, system. Uh, the Phoenix lander landed in May of 2008 in the upper right. Uh, the two uh, orbiting spacecraft, as you see in the upper left, 
uh, were reprogrammed in order to do store and forward operation. And of course, the two rovers plus the Mars Science Lander are part of that environment. I've neglected to mention that the uh, International Space Station is also running these new interplanetary protocols. And let me emphasize that when, while we believe that TCP IP would work OK on Mars and on Earth, which it does, it doesn't work very well between the planets. And the reason for that is the speed of light is too slow. So the round trip times from Earth to Mars range anywhere from 7 minutes to 40 minutes. And I can tell you that TCP IP was not designed to deal with a 40 minute round trip time. So uh, we've used a new set of protocols we call a delay and disruption tolerant networking protocols. And they are useful for both manned and robotic exploration. And they deal with both variable delay and with uh, episodic um, uh, disruption as a result of planetary motion or planetary rotation. If we uh, go to the next slide, what you'll see here is a kind of a fanciful idea that over time, as new missions get launched and as we adopt these standardized protocols, that we will literally grow a, uh, a backbone network across the solar system that will allow us to support manned and robotic exploration more effectively. Now, lest you imagine that this is pure science fiction, uh, I have one other slide to show you. Uh, and that's uh, one which is motivated by a project that the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency has started. Keep in mind that DARPA was the uh, party that funded the ARPANET project, then it funded the Internet project. And it is now funding uh, a study on whether a particular spacecraft could actually get to the nearest star in 100 elapsed years. Uh, it has. This project, so, is not an implementation project. It's a design project. And the idea is to try to get a propulsion system that will get us uh, to uh, the Alpha Centauri system uh, in less than 100 years, uh, as opposed to the present propulsion systems, which would take 65,000 years, which is a, a bit long even for a, a, a DARPA contract uh, effort. The other thing is navigation. Uh, and, you know, when you do mid-course corrections, normally you expect to transmit the mid-course correction and get a result back and transmit a new one, uh, depending on what the results are. But this doesn't work so well if your spacecraft is a light year away, because it takes a year for the signal to propagate and another year to come back. So um, uh, we think that the navigation problem can be solved autonomously on the spacecraft, because the information about the proper motion of the stars in the vicinity of uh, uh, in the nearby vicinity, 10 light years or so, those motions are well known. And so we can do autonomous navigation. The other problem is how do I signal uh, from, uh, you know, four and a half light years away and have it uh, actually be retrievable? And that's going to require um, uh, the use of, uh, of basically a backbone array of receivers that are spread across the solar system. And the reason for this is that uh, transmission coming from a spacecraft that's at uh, Alpha Centauri, uh, which is 4.4 light years away, is going to take 4.4 years. And uh, the question is, how do I detect a signal that's generated from something like that? And one answer might be using femtosecond lasers, which compress 100 watts of energy into 10 to the minus 15 seconds, which is a very, very big burst. And we may actually be able to see that. So uh, the team is in the process of redesigning propulsion systems and rethinking uh, communication systems so as to use what we call delay and disruption tolerant networking uh, technology in order to uh, manage the interstellar communication. So that's up to the date on the uh, interstellar missions that are uh, in planning stages. And I'm happy to switch over now to start Q&A. Uh, Vint, thank you very much for that uh, splendid presentation. Uh, it was great seeing the picture of the Mars uh, uh, Internet set. Uh, there are more elements there than there were on the ARPANET when I first started using it. So <laughs> there's been progress. Uh, so let me, uh, uh, there are lots of questions have been uh, sent in. We won't have time for more than a few, so let me just select a few uh, okay. for your consideration. Uh, is there a prediction for the future need of network technicians to add any needed infrastructure for the smart grid and presumably the rest of the new apps? 
So, uh, well, you know, prediction is always hard, especially about the future. But I can tell you that there is an absolute need for properly trained people, uh, not only on the application side, knowing all the protocols and things like that, but also on the operation side and on the design side to understand how to manage a system which will certainly have enormous scale, uh, how to confine the, uh, the control and the like to only authorized parties, uh, how to avoid the possibility that somebody is driving by, picks up a Wi-Fi signal, and does something to the appliances at the house. You have to have ways of preventing that from happening. This means strong authentication methods may be needed to uh, grant access and control. Uh, that might lead to two-factor authentication. That might lead to the need for uh, issuing such um, uh, credentials. Uh, all of that has to be developed. And so I, I think the Smart Grid program opens up an enormous opportunity for uh, people to become trained in and to execute uh, in that environment. So there's uh, no dearth of job opportunities there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can you comment on the penetration of IPv6, you know, sort of the protocol that keeps being in the future? You know, are we there? And, uh, uh, we, uh, and the implications for infrastructure because of it? Yes, it's a very good question. And it's uh, frankly been very disappointing uh, over time. Uh, as you well can imagine, uh, I was engaged in trying to help uh, bring that IPv6 protocol into into being just to, as a facilitator. Uh, and uh, when we reached a conclusion in 96 or 98, I, it's hard to accept the idea that 98 was 15 years ago. So the penetration is still very uh, modest. Uh, however, when we uh, launched uh, on June 6, 2012, we, we at Google turned on uh, our IPv6 capability for essentially all of our services and, and left it on. So our services are uh, essentially available on both v4 and v6. But I would say we're probably in the 1% uh, penetration level right now, which is pretty modest. But before you give up and despair and recognize that it's been 15 years and so on, first observation is we didn't run out of v4 addresses until 2011. And again, some of, some of the regional internet registries have not yet run out. It's urgent to get it implemented in parallel, and there's no question about that. Um, but I think that the pain of using uh, carrier-grade network address translation in order to keep IPv4 alive as the exclusive networking tool uh, is going to be an ugly uh, process and that some people, customers in particular, may eventually recognize that they have to ask for IPv6. Personally, I think that no ISP in the world should force a user to ask for it. It should be something that we all just implement in parallel and there should be no questions that both of them will work. Um, but it has not been the case that everyone is as committed as uh, I am and my colleagues here at Google. Uh, fortunately, uh, almost all the software that runs IPv4 will also run IPv6, uh, both in the networking software and in the edge devices, the hosts and the tablets and laptops and so on. The trouble is that um, most of the Internet service providers have tended not to turn on that capability in parallel. And there are lots of excuses for that, but none of them, uh, I, I don't consider any of them to be valid excuses anymore. I think that we have to turn things on not only to get going, but also to flush out any problems that there are associated with that uh, implementation of the Internet protocol. Well, I sure hope to see that happening real soon. Uh, Amen. Do you expect that, that software-defined networks, SDNs, will have an ad additional effect and also social implications uh, for new innovative technologies? Yes, I do. I had the pleasure of participating at least briefly in the software-defined open, open uh, networking uh, forum. And it's very clear that the flexibility of software definition uh, can uh, create a great deal of uh, adaptability that you wouldn't otherwise get in a more rigid environment. Uh, a trivial example of this, of course, is in the radio world where you're uh, going to the trouble of dynamically changing waveforms and uh, levels of uh, energy emissions and things of that sort in order to um, accommodate sharing of, uh, of capacity in particular frequency bands. 
this is a very neglected area uh, of opportunity because we don't use the radio spectrum more than about 2% of the time, and yet dynamic sharing is not common. I think with SDN, uh, we'll have an opportunity to allow multiple transmitters and receivers from multiple parties using the same uh, space, which is very different from the traditional allocation plan, which dedicates capacity to one user or one provider. Uh, so there's a, a lot of opportunity there for dynamic sharing uh, of uh, communication spectrum. And I hope that, uh, that we'll be able to take advantage of that technology in order to make much more uh, efficient use and more effective use of radio spectrum. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, a different topic about digital signatures. Who should manage them? States? people who currently issue passports and ID cards, or perhaps private companies, or something else? Well, actually, I think you could easily uh, produce scenarios in which any one of those is the logical uh, candidate to manage. I, first of all, I don't think that there should be only a single sole source for digital signatures. I think there's, there are many dangers associated with that. Second, uh, I think that uh, for uh, international credentials, for you know, visas and, and for traveling passports and things like that, I think it's inescapable that governments have to do that. But you know, when it comes to facilitating various transactions or managing bank accounts and, and showing that you have the authority to uh, manage a particular set of appliances or something along those lines, uh, you can imagine uh, issuing credentials. Uh, from the private sector, from the banking community, from the securities community, uh, from the utilities. And here we get into an interesting um, possibility that devices that uh, we use for authentication might hold more than one such uh, credential. I find that very attractive so that you only have one physical device that you need to carry around, but it could hold many uh, identifiers or pseudo, uh, what do we call them? Uh, I'm sitting here blanking on a good word for this. Uh, pseudonymous identifiers, in addition to um, identifiers that are that are bound to your identity as a person. So there are lots of cases where pseudonymity is perfectly acceptable, uh, and, and cases where anonymity is absolutely essential for safety. So I think that we should be looking for a variety of uh, different authorities to issue credentials, but we should hope for standardization so that a single device from a particular supplier would be able to hold multiple identities and either work with uh, other devices made by other suppliers uh, to the same standards. Well, following up on that last sub-theme, is standardization an important issue on future developments of the Internet? specifically uh, about data preservation, but of course more broadly? So uh, it, the question is absolutely, uh, the standardization is critical. It has been critical for the Internet and the World Wide Web. There's no doubt in my mind it will continue to be critical as a, as a way of achieving interoperability uh, and permitting competition because once standards are in place and multiple parties that can meet those standards have an opportunity to uh, to compete for market share. Uh, the, some of the uh, standardization elements in the Internet which have been stable for a long time, like the IP protocol, have also been very helpful uh, because of their stability. Uh, of course, the deeper you get into the Internet, uh, the harder it is to change things, which is why the IPv4 and IPv6 uh, extensions uh, have turned out to be such a challenge to get implemented. Nonetheless, I, I could not be more persuaded that standards work is absolutely essential, and sometimes getting the right standard is worth a ton of, uh, of software. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you think that the increasing governmental interest in cybersecurity might hinder the development of the Internet or, change, or at least re-steer it? I think two things are going to happen. One of them is that there will be uh, incremental improvements in security in the existing Internet. And we, we've seen multiple uh, efforts to uh, use uh, cryptogra cryptographic methods, strong authentication, end-to-end uh, -end cryptography, uh, selective uh, cryptography to control uh, important information like credit card numbers and other uh, accounting information or for that matter, uh, doing uh, one-time password generations. All of those things are happening in the existing Internet. 
I also think that uh, it has, not, has been a very healthy um, effort to look at clean sheet design of Internet. What would we do if we started all over again? Uh, the um, open flow uh, design, which came out of Stanford University, was supported by what was called the um, Future Internet Design uh, Research Projects, uh, sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And open flow has uh, become a very popular uh, mechanism for uh, designing and building internets. In fact, Google uh, adopted its use for the wide area networks linking the uh, data centers together just by way of example. So I think there's lots and lots of room here uh, for uh, serious work in, to amend the existing system and possibly also to explore what might be in the future uh, a replacement for the Internet. Um, let me throw in just one final question, if I may. As an old astronomer, I'm charmed by the plans for Alpha Centauri and the Internet. But uh, are there somewhat shorter-term benefits to the terrestrial in Internet from the analyses and engineering that have gone into the interplanetary and the uh, interstellar and eventually intergalactic net? Yeah. Well, I'm no, I'm, I think that I won't be around for the intergalactic work, but I'm, I'm having fun with the interstellar. And the answer is absolutely yes. We did experiments with European Union support uh, for the um, SAMI. These are the, lap, the uh, reindeer herders up in the northern part of Sweden. Uh, used these inter, inter, uh, interplanetary protocols uh, to communicate in an episodic way. So, for example, you would have a, uh, a laptop on the back of an all-terrain vehicle that would move into a village, pick up uh, information from the Wi-Fi available in the village, and then go to another village and dump the information using this delay and disruption tolerant protocols, and it actually worked very well. Uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency decided to test the idea that this would work in tactical communication and so ran a series of tests with the uh, Marine Corps at Fort A.P. Hill a few years ago, demonstrating that the delay and disruption tolerance system could deliver three to five times more data than the traditional TCP IP. And the reason for this was not magic. It's that the delay and disruption tolerance protocols will store information in the network uh, and then uh, regurgitate it when a path is available to go on the next hop. This is not the case with TCP IP. There's no storage available of, of any significant amount. And uh, if you don't have a place to forward something, you typically uh, discard it. So uh, the store and forward uh, nature of uh, packet switching was really uh, altered dramatically by this uh, notion of uh, uh, using the delay and disruption tolerant protocols to store information in the network. We didn't do that with TCP IP because at the time we were designing it, uh, memory was too expensive. Well, thank you very much, Vint. This has been an absolutely delightful hour. Uh, both uh, you, your about as far-reaching views as we can hope to see, uh, at least uh, for light years, and uh, certainly uh, a lot of fruit for thought. Uh, for the audience, this webinar will be available on demand at learning.acm.org in the next few days. Check out uh, ACM's other great learning resources, too. Uh, special thanks to the audience for taking the time to attend and participate and to submit uh, 75 questions, at least, that we did not have a chance to ask. Please take a moment to fill out our brief survey by checking on the red-colored widget on the right side of the bottom panel. It should only take you a minute or two. And uh, this is Stu Feldman thanking you very much for attending. Hope you can join us next time. If you have ideas for future topics or future speakers, email them to learning at acm.org. Thank you very much.